So uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our opening plenary speaker, uh, the one and only Bob Evans. One more opportunity for audience participation. How many here have never heard of Bob Evans? It's a restaurant. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. So, in that case, introductions can be really short. Um, there is uh, obviously some information in your, in your registration packages. Um, for those of you who are only a little bit familiar with them, you'll be more familiar by the end of uh, the conference, I'm sure. The only thing I wanted to uh, do at this point is uh, borrow uh, one of my favorite quotes without permission from uh, Greg Stoddart, uh, who describes Bob as the Wayne Gretzky of health economics. <laughs> Not only because he performs his, gra his craft at a different, higher level than anyone else, but also because he elevates the game of all of those around him. Um, I've been amongst those, uh, fortunate enough to have had my game elevated by Bob and there was certainly plenty of room for elevation. There's a lot more about Bob in the soon-to-be-published collection of his works, An Undisciplined Economist. Unfortunately, um, despite our best efforts, we had hoped actually to have this book. We were going to do a book launch at the conference. Uh, unfortunately, we grossly underestimated the amount of time and effort it takes to uh, get a book into print, despite the fact that we started two years ago. Uh, I won't bore you with the gory details. Well, I'm happy to bore you with anyone with the gory details who wants to uh, talk to me about it in the halls, but I'm not going to do it here. Um, Bob is one of those colleagues, along with uh, Greg and Jonathan Lomas uh, and probably a few others, um, whom we've uh, pried from the steely grip of retirement for this event. He sort of had no choice given that we built the program around him, um, but we're still actually grateful that he said yes. Uh, today he's agreed to talk about one of his favorite hobby horses, the things that economists can say, the things that they do often say, and the confusion and harm created by the latter. So I give you Bob Evans. Thank you very much, Morris, and thank you to the previous speakers. Wow. I mean, this is extraordinary. I, I'm not going to go into more detail. I think wow conveys most of what I wanted to say. But the idea that this conference would be here, people would be coming, built around what I've been working on for the best part of 50 years now, and the extraordinary efforts that went into producing this book, it's, um, I'm not going to say it's humbling, because I'm not sure that really is the right word. It's just extraordinary. And in, in which context you might think that the debt that I'm talking about would have been more to them than to, uh, to uh, Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon, I think it's worth drawing this out, was talking about Machiavelli, whose name at the time he was writing was a byword for the devil. You'll find that in Shakespeare. Bacon saw through that, and it seems to me that he saw something that was extremely important for economics, apart from anything else. The, 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 the need to try to separate uh, the, 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 the moral propositions which we throw around happily, especially in economics but everywhere else, try public health sometime, from the actual analysis of what people really do. And I think that will be, uh, I'll be coming back to that idea at several points in my talk. But I do want to say that I, I am fully cognizant of the debt that I owe to the folks who put this conference together and the folks who have chosen to come. That's, that's amazing. The, the book, you might think that a bunch of reprints consists of a bit of work with a Xerox machine and a couple of cover, covers. Uh, why did it take them two years? Um, it's a whole lot more than that. And if you haven't done it, I think twice before taking it on. I'm not sure Mar I'm not sure Morris would do it again if he had the choice. But the, the, and then behind that is a debt to other colleagues over many years, a debt to UBC, which has been an extraordinarily helpful and supportive environment for me. Um, I, you know, I, I agonized long and hard over deciding to come here, but I made the right decision. So that's been great. But those debts are more akin to the national debt. They're too big to ever imagine repaying. 
paying. It's not gonna happen, forget it. <laughs> um, so really, the best one can hope for is that that huge debt was incurred for productive purposes. And I'm just gonna, that, that I have to leave to others. But repayment doesn't happen. So I'm focusing instead on the debt that uh, Bacon was talking about. Now, just as part of the footnote to that, Morris helpfully went to the internet and found that actually I got the quote wrong. It's, no, he didn't say debt. He said, we are much beholden to Machiavell and others, et cetera. Uh, thanks, Morris. Um, yeah, the, the best of memories can't compete with the internet. But, but, but try, to build up, try, try, try to build a metaphor around the national beholden. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work nearly, nearly as well. Uh, the next piece I want to reflect upon is the comment that, or the, the statement that life can only be understood backwards, but it has to be lived forward, so said Kierkegaard. Uh, yeah, I guess that's right, unless you're Merlin, the character in T.H. White's Once and Future King, who did in fact live his life backwards, but it's not clear that it was a great advantage to him. So I'm taking the opportunity to look back, trying to understand a life by looking backwards, that a life that was in fact lived forwards, and I think this is, I think this is more useful than a lot of what goes on in economics because economists, and I'm one, I'm fully you know, part of this, have a tendency to be constantly looking forwards but steering from the rear view mirror. Um, and I'm not the first to have made that comment. Well, one of the things that my wife and I actually have discovered since we retired, uh, because uh, I won't take you through the fascinating details of UBC's pension plan, which is a, 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 a surprisingly good one for something designed by a bunch of economists, <laughs> which it was, um, that we are spending a lot of time looking at the financial pages. And we have discovered that in financial journalism, there is a stock phrase which is so commonly used that there may actually be a dedicated key on their keyboards. You just hit the key and the phrase comes out. And the phrase is, economists were surprised when fill in the blank. <laughs> I, I, you know, it, if, if you actually spend any time poking around in those pages, you'll find this is absolutely true. Most recently, the Canadian GDP has apparently grown five times as fast in the last quarter as anybody expected, and economists were duly surprised. Uh, and Galbraith said quite a long time ago, economists do not foretell the future because they know what is going to happen. They foretell the future because people ask them and pay them, and this is a true thing. So. I, I've kind of stayed away from that. When I went to university, I really wanted to be a historian, but I found that uh, my chances of making the world a better place were probably greater with economics. I was pretty young and naive then. And uh, anyway, economics paid better. So although I obviously had the right instincts for economics. So that's why I'm going to spend my time looking backwards at what I think was relevant in the, the, the career, what, what, I, what I learned and didn't learn in the career that I seem to have left, uh, that I seem to have finished up, more or less. The other thing is, some of you, many of you will realize as you get older, it's not too hard to, no to notice, that you've got a heck of a lot more past and it's growing all the time, but the future is kind of shrinking. And uh, so, so, you know, what, we, can, we can leave the future to one side. There's much more interesting things going on in the past. So I went back as well to uh, a, an economist who is enjoying something of a revival at the moment after a brief period of, well, an extended period of, of uh, obscure, well, he was never really obscure. And that's John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes wrote a preface in 1935 to his magisterial, uh, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, in which he talked about his own long struggle to escape from habitual modes of thought that ramify into every corner of our minds. Well, kind of interesting. And he said, and you who read this book, if you're going to get anything out of it, you're going to have to go through the same struggle. Hmm. And he was talking about something more than, although certainly that's included, the struggle against the habitual modes of thought of those people who kind of run the world on fixed lines and are not interested much in new ideas, uh, and who, bring, who keep bringing back the old ones. And that recurrence of old ideas is a theme that I'm going to pick up again at the end tomorrow. It's an idea that we, uh, the, my, my colleagues, have coined the term uh, zombies, ideas that are intellectually dead, 
but keep coming back to stride around making trouble, and you keep refuting them, and they get, they get dead, and they come back to life again. And they do this, of course, because they, su they support both strong economic interests and strong ide ideological commit convictions. They don't have a lot of basis in fact or argument, but that turns out not to be the problem. But Keynes was actually talking about something more than that. He was talking about the ideas that occupy our own minds when we set out to try to think clearly about the world around us. And the difficulty of clearing away a lot of what we have learned. And so for, with somebody who, for somebody who had a very good economics education, I can say that, that whoa, sorry about that. Uh, I can say that that was very definitely the case for me. Uh, that there's a lot, if I look back over my oeuvre, that you sort of think, gee, I should have done that differently. That was, that was yeah, hmm. yeah I, I think I know where those ideas came from and I don't agree with them anymore. So I think he was pointing to something really pretty important. And as he said, the ideas that he was offering, really pretty simple. But the difficulty was fitting them into the conventional modes of thought that made it, made it hard, to, hard to sort of reconcile them, hard to, hard to make sense out of them. And I think, that, I think that was, that's, that's, been, that's been fairly important as I, as I think about what I've been trying to do. And I think that um, if I look at the two halves of my career, if there is, can be divided in half rather neat, one has to do with attempting to understand, interpret, explain, the behavior, the, the economic, oh, sorry, the healthcare system from an economic perspective, that's been a major part of my work throughout, you know, and it's most of what's discussed in this conference, and it's most of what comes out in the book, as, you know, as you'll see if you buy the book, please do. Um, but the, and the other half, which was uh, really initiated sort of, well, about halfway through my career, which has been thinking, trying to think with a number of colleagues very seriously about the determinants of health and what, uh, you know, get back behind the healthcare system, which is one, certainly one of the important components of the determinants of health, but only one, and, th and, and to, uh, to sort of explore that in considerable detail. So those were the two bits of my career. And it's interesting as I think about that, that there were two individuals who were critical at the beginning of each of those phases. The third, the, the, the second phase, mid-career, was Fraser Mustard, who pointed out quite firmly to me, as Fraser Mustard always would. Those of you who know Fraser Mustard, the moose, will know what I'm talking about. But uh, uh, that, that there, there, there were some bits missing, as it were, in my intellectual structure. So Fraser was critical to my getting involved in the determinants of health. But the person who was really critical in getting me into health care, getting thinking about the health care system, this is for a guy who started off thinking he wanted to be a mathematical economist, uh, was my wife. And I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. I just want to mark those two people as being among many, many colleagues who were important as being critical at the turning points. Now, that, that in, in the process, I came upon what seemed to me to be two, I'm not sure whether they're symmetric, symmetric gaps I was, started thinking about Ikebana, you know, flower arrangements, the places where the flowers are not, and thinking about symmetric uh, treatments in the first half and the cur in, in the second half. And in, the, in, the, in thinking about the healthcare system, you think about mainstream economics tackles that uh, without any sense of agency. In other words, the, the, there are consumers and there are, that, and there are firms and there are, there are transacting entities, but all of these transacting entities are bound by very rigidly specified objectives and constraints and they follow through sort of optimizing under those objectives and constraints. They don't have any, really, when it comes down to it, they don't have any discretion. There isn't any individual agency or even group agency. It's a mechanical model, and that's very helpful if you're trying to create a science, I suppose, or the impression of a science, but it may not be too accurate in describing what's actually going on out there. Conversely, if you think about health, the, the, the sort of traditional views of the determinants of health, and particularly health promoters, it's all agency. It's people who make unhealthy choices. If you're, not, if, you're, if, you're, if you're obese, it's something you chose. If you're smoking, it's something you chose. And that kind of leads, whereas the, the, the mechanical model of economics leads toward pseudoscience, this one leads ultimately toward victim blaming. It's, not, it's really what it comes down to is if, if you're unwell, it's your fault. 
And I think it, it, the two bits of my career and the people that I've been involved in, the first part had to do with reintroducing agency into what was going on in the healthcare system. People actually have discretionary power, particularly doctors. They make, they're, now there's, a, there's an insight for you. Um, <laughs> But it is an insight for a lot of mainstream economics in North America. The idea that there's actually discretionary power going on and being exercised out there and people are making decisions that they could have made otherwise. No, not in the economic model. But a lot of what I've been working on is to try to reintroduce, to document, to use other people's ability to document what actually was happening out there. Okay, and on the other side of things, take the agency out of it. Well, People, people don't choose or not choose to smoke in the same way that they choose chocolate ice cream over vanilla, which is a perfectly good choice. Well, it's what you ought to do. But uh, um, the, the, the idea that you, uh, you, you take up these things as consumption choices is nonsense. It arises out of your life context. It arrives out of what we used to talk about as lifestyle, the, the context in which people work and live. But again, the word lifestyle has somehow become perverted over the years into talking about choosing chocolate over vanilla. But that's, that, that loses the whole point, that the kind of decisions that people make that bear on their health arises out of, arise out of their social environments. And a lot of the focus of the population health program that I was privileged to be involved in for a number of years had to do with what is it about those social environments and how do those social environments get under the skin to have biological consequences. And uh, that was all captured in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the summary label that Jonathan Lomas d assigned to our, what came out as our book, Why Are Some People Healthy and Others Not? And I think it was carried forward brilliantly by, by uh, Clyde Hertzman, uh, which is where we run into the much more difficult question of why some people are dead and others aren't. I mean, talk about talk about a tragedy, not just personally, but a tragedy for the discipline and for the field, and you know, all a, a bloody waste. But there it is, and you move on. So that that has to do with um, you know the the notion of reintroducing agency into the economic model and diluting it into the in in the public health and health promotion model as being the kind of symmetrical efforts of the of the career. Now. In thinking about the economic framework, I discovered something that um, probably I should have thought of a lot earlier in my career, and that is the work of Joan Robinson at Cambridge. Now, I went to the, for, that, for that purpose, I went to the wrong Cambridge. I went to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and was very well trained by people there who were on the other side of the, some very interesting high theory controversies between the, known as the Cambridge controversies in capital theory. Uh, about, and I've already told you about all I know about that. But at one time, <laughs> at one time, I knew enough to fake my way through my PhD comprehensives. And having done that, that's sufficient. <laughs> but John Robinson, by the way, among other things, delivered the view that we do not study economics in order to understand the economy. We study economics in order not to be deceived by economists. Jo Joan Robinson is probably the most distinguished economist not to have received the, the Nobel Prize in Economic Science, perhaps because of views like that, perhaps because a lot of her work undermined the efforts to create the impression that the economics is or could be a science. It isn't, it can't be, uh, but uh, you don't like people of prominence like hers going around proving it. Um, and then, uh, 50, thanks. And then, of course, she was a woman working in the 30s. I'm sure that had nothing whatever to do with it. But the fact is, she didn't get one. So she introduced another very interesting metaphor, which she actually cred credits her to her colleague uh, Michio Morishima, which sounds plausible. And that is the notion that conventional price theory, which with great effort and stretching, uh, still, we find many economists trying to apply to the healthcare system. Conventional price theory is rather like kabuki theater. Now, I don't know very much about kabuki theater, so I'm just drawing on what she said about it. But the point there is that the, the puppets carry all the action, and there are property men, property men dressed in black who move the puppets around and produce whatever emanations they produce, and the convention of the theater is that the property men are not there. 
That's why they're in black. You don't see them, they're not there. All the action is the puppets. And she said, but that's very much like what goes on in micro theory. The commodities have all the speaking parts. People don't actually do anything. People go through the process of, you know, the, the, the consumer is assigned a utility function, he is assigned various constraints, he maximizes Bing, that's done, you out of the way. And all that's really interested, interesting is whether the right levels of output of different kinds of commodities are being produced and whether the economy is functioning in a economically efficient manner where efficiency is defined in a very formal sense, which anybody in this room who's not an economist will not recognize, nor should you, uh, but it does have a, a very specific and very limited formal meaning. So I thought that that, that metaphor of the sort of conventional theory as kabuki, kabuki theater was really quite fascinating, and I think I could have profited a great deal more from paying more attention to Cambridge, England than to Cambridge, uh, to Cambridge, Massachusetts. But, you know, you make the choices you do and you wind up where you do. And, um, and uh, so a lot of my, my career has been working my way through what I thought to be the realities of healthcare systems and coming out with some sort of view that, as, as, as I say, is closer to, to Joan Robinson's than it ever was when it started. She did actually give a talk at Cambridge well, at Mass while I was there. I didn't go. I mean, nobody was interested in her. You know, well, okay, you know. So you learn something, I guess, over time. But we, as you know the expression, we get too soon old and too late smart. It's certainly true of me. Anyway, but you, know, you learn a few things along the way. So going on from there, um, the, the, so bringing, bringing agency back in, the next stage is to fill out a little bit what I meant about the role that my wife played and others in getting me into the healthcare system, which then forced me to be very much more critical about the way conventional economics works. So there we are. I'm studying for my comprehensives, working all night. My wife is nursing at the Mass General, working all night. She gets home and we talk to each other over breakfast and we compare notes. We've always talked a lot. We've been talking, we've been talking ever since we first met, all the time. That's why we're still married after 51 years. But um, there was quite a discrepancy between what I was learning with great effort and great commitment to get through my comps and what she was telling me about the way hospitals were working. There's just not a lot of connection here, folks. <laughs> And furthermore, hospitals are big. It's a large part of the economy. And this is the mid 60s, it's getting bigger. Okay, the Americans have introduced Medicare and Medicaid and all that kind of stuff. And there's just a whole lot more money and activity flowing into that sector. And what I'm learning is not telling me squat about how it works. If anything, it's misleading. Well, that's a little tricky. That's, you know, well, hmm, hmm, something ought to be done about that. And that really got me started thinking about the economics of that sector. And there was another one which I think deserves to be mentioned now. Some of you will know the name Lester Thoreau. He died about a week ago. Okay, he was, had been head of the Sloan School of Management at MIT and, and was described in the obit as a political economist. Now that's very interesting because he sure as hell wasn't when I knew him. Uh, he'd, he'd come a long road too. He was a section man, i.e. a sort of a teach assi teaching assistant in my public finance course in 1965. I've, I've seen a lot of him since then, but now I see he's on the other end. Um, and he did a tour of the horizon of the US economy for us on one occasion. And he said, and of course the doctors got their cut meaning that the rate of inflation of physicians' fees and healthcare costs generally, the rate of price, in, price inflation, was about 2% ahead of the whole rest of the economy. And it had been, that was normal. He said, you know, yeah, the doctors got their cut, another 2% for them. He said, yeah, they did. Why? Why was that? Aren't we learning a whole lot of macro theory that's supposed to tell us about that? Answer, no. We didn't tell us anything about it. So there, 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 and there have been sort of efforts to rationalize that observation in the US economics literature. They remind one rather of Claudius Ptolemy. And those of you who are not familiar with Claudius Ptolemy, who was in fact a brilliant mathematician, uh, invented all those epicycles to explain why the, the uh, sun really did go around the earth. Um, I, we can talk about him afterwards. So 
those two strands led me into studying the, being interested in studying this field. And the first person, the first real explanation I got that helped was actually a classic article by George Akerlof called "The Market for Lemons." And it was all about used cars, and explored what happened to the, the market if one side of the transaction had information that the other side didn't have. The seller of the car knows the car. The buyer, by hypothesis, only knows the a average condition of used cars. And under those circumstances, you can have a market disappear entirely. There are people who want to buy, people who want to sell, but the market disappears. And that turned out to be a perfect explanation for the market for private health insurance. And you might think there's a lot of private health insurance out there, but there really isn't any, or very, very little. You can buy insurance when you're going traveling into the United States. That's probably pretty close to a private market. But in general, despite what you might think from watching the US or Canadian, Canadian pharmaceuticals, there's no such thing as a private market in insurance, for God's sake. The people who buy it have to buy it. It's part of the employment contract. They are heavily, those, those purchases are heavily subsidized by governments in both Canada and the United States. About a third of what is, is paid out by private insurance companies is actually public funds shoveled through the back door through what are called tax expenditures. So they only raise about two thirds of the funds that they do pay out. They pay less, in the, even in the US, they pay less than half of the total of cost of healthcare, even with that subsidy included. So, and, and, and th this is of course because the real, the real uh, costly ones, the elderly, the poor, the people with various kinds of gas ghastly long-term illnesses, the veterans, they've all been hived off. They're paid by government. So there's this little bit of highly profitable public, uh, high, highly profitable insurance markets that the insurance industry collects and makes its money from and makes a lot of money from and spends a lot of money from because the, the overhead costs are extraordinary and that's all been very well documented. The overhead costs are high because the most important thing you can do if you're running a private insurance company is don't insure the dogs. Identify who the high risk people are and shove them out. Get somebody else to pay for them. Get the government to pay for them. Get the, you know, but don't you cover them because otherwise you're going to lose money. And uh, for-profit firms don't like to lose money. So it's not really very hard to understand why private insurance works the way it does, but Akerlof's piece was way back in 74, really opened that up, said it has to do with asymmetric information. And that was the key. Okay? And then when you start thinking about healthcare systems, Boy, is there asymmetric information. Wow. Um, as it happens, looking forward, I think, to participating in the roast, my friend, colleague, and, and, uh, and uh, GP is here today. Um, he can tell you about asymmetric information in very personal terms. Um, what he's going to say at the roast, I'm not sure. But uh, the, the, the point is that the, the, the notion of asymmetric information turned out to be the crucial insight for understanding why healthcare systems are organized the way they are, why they function the way they are, why they develop the kind of problems they do, and what do you do to try to, to, try to improve that situation? How do you try to, and you don't do it by trying to, to make every, every patient his own, his own doctor, and sure, I'm all in favor of more information for patients and patient-centered this, that, and the other, but it's just, when the chips are down, it's not really going to happen. I'm a very experienced patient, by the way. I speak with full authority on this as a patient. <laughs> Five minutes, thanks. Okay. So that, that, that has been a theme developed through, I think, most of my research. The one that I said was stumbled on in, in uh, well, mid-70s, late 70s, and have been working out, trying to work out the implications of it ever since. And it's one that is anathema to mainstream economics because it means you can't use all that hard-learned hard apparatus of demand and supply and profit maximization and all the, all the, all the sort of the, the, the mathematizations that if economists have developed in order to, uh, to, to <coughs> deceive others, as Joan would say. Um, <laughs> I'm not prepared to go that far. Sometimes it actually works. Sometimes the apparatus works brilliantly. Other times, not so much. And in trying to understand the way healthcare systems work, it doesn't work worth a damn. And the, most, the first really leading distinguished article written in this field, Uncertainty in the Welfare Economics of, of Medical Care, written by one of the most distinguished economic theory, theorists of the uh, 20th century, 
Kenneth Arrow, is about as misleading a paper as you could ever hope to read. It really sent a whole generation of economists down the wrong road. And unfortunately, it's too late in my life that I can ever write the paper that exposes that fully, but I now know what the paper looks like, and it probably doesn't matter anyway because nobody would pay any attention. Um, but uh, but it, it can be done rigorously. And I will. Now, back off a bit then. Okay, if you have to try to think about what it is that people really do, and you can't rely on much of the apparatus, or at least put it differently, you have to, and Akerlof has done a lot of this. He also got a no, shared a Nobel Prize for it, which was one of those very rare Nobel Prizes in economics that were actually deserved. Um, there are more of them lately. Since they stopped giving them automatically to dopes from Chicago, um, they, they, they've, improved, they've improved a lot. Uh, so Akerlof has done a lot of that saying, well, supposing we take the basic apparatus of economics, the basic theoretical frameworks, and we just twist it a little bit here, and we add something else over here, what happens now? And often, you actually come out with some very plausible results in terms of approximating what it is that people actually do. But how are you going to find out what people actually do? Lord Chesterfield, in his letters to his son, said, the knowledge of the world is only to be gained in the world and not in a closet, meaning a small office. Okay? And the economics journals dealing with healthcare are full of articles written by young males, by the way, who have never experienced the healthcare system, um, writing in their little closets. Okay? So how do you get out of the closet? Well, the answer is, and is basically Countway and colleagues. Countway is the medical library at Harvard, which is where I spend a lot of time because I had the advantage when I did my doctorate that there was very little economics literature. So in order to have a respectable bibliography, I had to read a lot of the medical and the health services literature, and that means I spent a lot of time over at Countway. And I think that was a huge example advantage. Today's PhDs have the disadvantage that there's plenty of economics literature to pad out a good-looking bibliography, and that's a serious disadvantage. So Countway was good. Colleagues were good right from the very beginning, working with the, the, the sorts of people that I, I had the privilege of working with at Chasper, working early on with a very far-seeing pediatrician by the name of Jeff Robinson, uh, working more lately with the Canadian, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Program in Population Health. Now there was an intellectually exciting environment. A whole lot of bright people, very bright people, energetic people, all of whom knew a whole lot of stuff I didn't know. I mean, you can't ask for much better than that, and my job was to lead them. <coughs> Leadership consists of finding out which way the parade is going, running out in front and saying, follow me! If you can manage to do that, you look good. And they did, they did some wonderful stuff, and, uh, the, not least of which was producing Clyde Hertzman. Um, now, that's, I think, about as far as, I'm about five minutes, all right? Yeah, you're done. I'm done. Okay, last thing. <laughs> what, 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 do I, what do I, I haven't said much about pop health, because a lot of the work was done by others. But I would mention a couple of things that we might have, with the things we missed. We didn't do enough on diet. Morris kept trying to prod us in that direction. We didn't do it. We didn't do anything much on gender, although it's really important in differential health status. I didn't want to touch that. I, I could recognize trouble when I saw it. Um, <laughs> finally, what about the social gradient in the biome? Is there one? We didn't know anything about biomes. We knew that antibiotics upset your stomach, but that's about all. We knew a long time ago. But what about the, the social context of the biome? Wouldn't that be kind of fun to look at? I don't know. It's somebody else's job. And there are probably several others like that. But that's enough. Morris says I'm out of time, and uh, I'm sure he is an honorable man. And um, so I will, I will simp my, take my leave and thank you all for coming. Sure. Okay. So, uh, thanks, Bob. Um, I, Thank you. I, I, I just wanted to make sure he stayed roughly on time so that we'd have an opportunity for um, uh, people to have at him. Uh, and so, the floor is open. We've got about uh, 10 minutes, and uh, I'm sure he'd love to answer all your questions. Um, he will not be able to see you, so please identify yourselves uh, if you come to the mics, and um, yeah. Yeah, that's the other reason I gave up economic forecasting. <laughs> <laughs> well, while people are thinking, let me kick off uh, with one. 
So <clears throat> I guess my question would be, um, is there any hope that the, uh, the economics uh, profession can actually be made useful? And, and I guess what motivates the question is that um, the errors of their ways, I mean, you and others have, have been pretty articulate uh, about exposing the problems. So we know the emperor has no clothes, but the emperor keeps ruling. That's the question? That's the question. <laughs> it's an easy one for you. <clears throat> no. <laughs> uh, I, I, went, I go back again to Keynes. Those of you who have, which is probably most of you, don't give me a show of hands, it doesn't help much. Uh, those of you who have not read the last section of the last chapter of Keynes, General Theory, uh, are missing a treat. It's the extraordinary one in which he develops the theme that the ideas of philosophers and folks like us are far more important than, and more effective than people generally recognize. It has that wonderful phrase, madmen in authority who hear voices in the air, this was being written in 1936, uh, are typically distilling their frenzy from the pages of some academic scribbler of a few generations back. And it expresses the sort of, the, but the, the, the longer term hope <coughs> that over a period of about 30 years, because it takes that long to get rid of the dinosaurs and bring in people with new ideas. You know, the people who have the new ideas are all young, but they don't actually get to the levers of power for about 30 years. And then they, then they do what they learned in their youth. But that he feels, he felt that his ideas would eventually come to the fore. And they did in the 19, you know, in the, in the post-war. And after the, after the war was the period of Keynesianism. But the empire struck back, and we went, through, uh, we went through the Chicago period, and finally that all seems to have bust up. And now we're bringing Keynes back again. So I think there's more of a cycle than a progress, than the kind of progress that he envisioned. So what does that have to do with this? Well, the academic economists do seem to continue to work within the same old habitual modes of thought, but I think you, I, the hope, I think, comes from going around them, from talking to, from re writing for people who can, in fact, see that that's not the way the world actually is. So, that the, uh, so the Americans do now have a form of public health insurance. It's not perfect. Uh, in fact, uh, my colleague Ted Marmer, who is here, has, very has pointed out very nicely that they have, in fact, five different healthcare systems. You know, they have a, they have an, a, 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 well, a, they have a, a, a sort of a universal public insurance system for the elderly, and another one for the poor, and another one for the, and another one for veterans, and a different than a, the private system for those people who can afford it, and then a certain, a certain amount of nothing for those people at the bottom. There are really five different systems. And Obamacare is grafted onto that, and it's got lots of flaws. But progress has been made in spite of the economists, who are still explaining why it's a bad idea. <laughs> Martin Feldstein, who was on my thesis committee and who stars in a, an Oscar-winning documentary that you all should see called uh, uh, Inside Job, and it, it, it features several economists from Harvard and from the Columbia Business School looking like absolute scoundrels in talking about the way the, the, um, the uh, crisis, the financial crisis of 08, 09 developed. And Martin Feldstein is one of them. And he was, of course, taken on as an advisor afterwards. Uh, and he explained at great length to a Senate Finance Committee that I saw that um, Adopting a universal public health insurance system like Canada would dramatically reduce the GNP of the United States per capita. How was it going to do that? Well, there was an elaborate mathematical explanation. Had it worked that way in Canada? No. Did it work that way in Europe? No. But it really did. It just you didn't realize that. He was also the guy who said when they brought in Medicare, Medicaid in the States, there will be a huge increase in demand. You know, the, the standard economic model says demand, blah, 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 it'll go up. It didn't. There was no increase. But the costs went up dramatically because of the way they financed it. So he turned around and he said, well, if the costs went up, then actually the quantity has also gone up because you have to allow for the fact that we now have the same number of bed days, but they're of higher quality. <laughs> and so the quality adjusted 
quantity has gone up. How do you know they're higher quality? Well, they cost more. <laughs> the conference where he delivered himself of that, I think Tony Cullier, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, described it as misguided ingenuity, which I thought was a nice com compact way of describing it. It was, it was also spoofed by G.B. Trudeau in the Doonesbury strip of uh, an exchange between Duke and a off-screen Trump saying, look at the quality, look at the quality. Well, by qu excuse me, sir, by quality, do you mean that it's obscenely expensive? Uh, yeah, are there any other definitions? <laughs> and that was what Marty did. So I, I pick on him just because he was my, one of my advisors and I sort of watched his career since. Point being that I think he represents the, the answer to your question. And I think so, is there, what, so what do you do? I think you just have to go round them and you have to look particularly for economists who have suffered illness in their youth. There are a couple of good examples of people who thought, who do think straight, having actually been through the system. But so long as you're trying to talk to uh, young, healthy males with good mathematical skills, I don't know how far you're gonna get. Okay, well seeing no further questions, um, I'm going to, uh um, we're going to take about uh, five minutes to do a, a quick shuffle and get the, the next panel up. But uh, first, uh, let me uh, take a moment to thank Bob on behalf of everyone here for um, another, uh, I sort of, for me, I've, I've, I've heard him so many times, it's all a, another usual brilliant speech. But thank you again, Bob, for another usual brilliant speech. Well, thank you, David. Thank you all.